Bible, there are some comments and things before you actually get into the verses, the chapters and verses. And in this Bible here, it talks about approaches to understanding. Okay, approaches to understanding the book of Revelation. All right? And they get, it says, in the course of Christian history, there have been four main ways that people <coughs> try to apply the visions of the book of Revelation. And that would also be true with the book of Daniel, too. Well, yeah, Revelation 14 or 1? Okay, I'm, I'm actually looking just before the book of Revelation at the, uh, the author's comments and notes here. It's okay. the notes and stuff. It may, not even be in, it may not be in your Bible. <laughs> Okay, you may, you may not even have it in your Bible. Some of them have maps. And different it just comments. gives you an overview of what's going, okay. what's going to be about. <clears throat> but what I wanted to bring out was, here you have, within uh, many Bibles that people are looking at, here you have four main me methods of interpreting the book of Revelation, for example. Okay, that's what it's saying here. You have the, and you may be familiar with these terms, the preterist view, the futurist view, the idealist view, <clears throat> the historicist view. Now, what do they mean? And again, here are scholars, people in academia, that say, okay, we, we think that uh, the book of Revelation should be viewed from a perspective of the preterist, the preterist perspective. Now, what is, it, what is, it, what is preterism? Anybody have any idea what that means? Okay. Uh, again, big words that, that simply mean you know, John, when John sent his message, where did he send the, his, his messages to? Same churches. Okay, so the preterist view is simply that the, the message of Revelation was for those literal seven churches. Okay? And we might be able to see how somebody could come to that conclusion because the Bible says, John, take these and send them to the seven churches. Now, there were more than seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century. Okay? There were probably a couple of dozen churches in Asia Minor, maybe 40 or 50 even. John, God, God directs the message to go to seven particular ones, seven literal churches. Okay? And so the Preter's view believed that the book of Revelation was written to the seven specific first century churches in Asia Minor. Now how about the futurist view? What does that sound like? Wants to be in the future. Okay, that's kind of the that's the exact opposite, right? In other words, they're saying we believe these messages are for events that will take place in the future. But actually, it could be both. Well, that, that's again, that's what we're going to get to. Right? The conclusion we're going to come to is that very conclusion. Um, how about the idealist interpretation? What does that sound like? What they want it to be. Okay, ideas, concepts, principles. Uh, it says here. Um, um, many believe that the purpose of the book is to provide in symbolic terms broad principles for everyday life and society. Okay? So these are like lessons that people are supposed to apply you know, across the board in any situation. And then the historicist view believe that Revelation speaks to the full range of Christian history from John's day to the second coming. Okay? Now that one falls more into kind of a summary of all the rest of them, doesn't it? Right? But what we, what we want to understand is that the Hebrew, you know, this book is, this is a Hebrew book written by Hebrews, to Hebrews, for Hebrews, and the Hebrew perspective of interpretation is all of these are possibilities, okay? And if you wanted to just sum it up, you could say um, multiple, and this particularly is applicable in prophetic language, multiple applications pointing to the ultimate fulfillment, okay? Now, <clears throat> history provides all the multiple applications, right? What's the ultimate fulfillment? Where are the ultimate fulfillments? Well, the, the Jews was the one, the reason it was given to them, they were the ones supposed to take the gospel to the world. Sure. And uh, they wouldn't, they uh, more or less refused. That's the reason God turned to the Gentiles. Okay. So, <clears throat> if you have multiple applications throughout history, and they're all pointing to a conclusion or an ultimate fulfillment, right, where do you think those ultimate fulfillments would be listed? Say so it would be in Revelation. The book of Revelation. Okay. So it seems logical to conclude that the way God set this up, 
because again, he's using the Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew interpretation, is that you have all these applications, but they're pointing to the ultimate. Okay, and so he would <clears throat> he would, of course, list the ultimate fulfillments someplace, and people could could through history make an association. Okay, and we'll look at some examples um, of that in just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, the other thing we want to, want to mention, so you've got the, uh, the Hebrew interpretation of Scripture, that's an important thing that we need to consider. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is the dual application concept. Um, open your Bibles to Matthew 24 for just a second. Okay, Matthew 24, most of us are very familiar with the story. Okay? And for the sake of anybody that's uh, viewing online, uh, we'll go through and just uh, bring out some of the highlights or summarize it. But Jesus is sitting with the disciples. <clears throat> or Actually, he's departing from the temple. And the disciples are just they are wowed by the impressiveness of the structures. And so they're commenting about that. And what does Jesus reply? Not one stone. He said, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's talking now about the destruction of the place that they're admiring. He's talking about their destruction. And so obviously, um, they're, now they're very curious as to when all this is going to take place. Not only curious, but shocked because they did not enter the temple. Yeah, I mean, this is the whole the whole Jewish the whole Jewish economy, right there. society focuses around the temple. Okay, and now Jesus is saying basically your whole way of life is going to come to an end. So they're sitting in the Mount of Olives, and the disciples come and start asking questions that that if we were there we would ask. We would ask the same questions. When when are these things going to happen? You know, what's going to be the sign of uh, in fact the end of the world? It says here. But isn't that what we're asking today? Are we asking for these road signs that shows us where we are, what the next step is, the next step, right, everything right down to before Christ's second coming? Isn't that what we're doing? We are really doing that, aren't we? We're, we're just as curious as they were. Sure. We want to know uh, the how and the when and, of course, the why, etc. Um, Jesus starts listing things, deception, uh, <clears throat> wars, rumors of wars, uh, See that you are not troubled. You know, that's an important thing we need to want to, we always want to point that out. There, there, there's always going to be commotion and anarchy and, and, and things going on in the world because we're caught in the middle of a supernatural warfare. But, but I love these words here. See that you're not troubled. Deception, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, famine. Uh, of course, the, the list is quite long and distinguished of, of the events that we could list concerning end-time uh, events, such as, you know, economic collapse, um, you know, all kinds of things can be listed here. See that you are not troubled. Okay? See well, that you're not troubled. These are thing. the beginnings, it says your That's sorrows. Right. Well, not only that, but you know, out of 6,000 years, there ain't been but 200, 213 years, I think, of peace. 213 years peace out of 6,000. Yeah. So whenever he would, said there would be wars and rumors, <coughs> they didn't question that, right? <laughs> yeah. And when he said there would be wars and rumors, for these were things that were already going on okay. continuously. That's the excavating at a faster rate, also. Sure, sure. Because we're getting closer to the end, aren't we? Yeah. So things are accelerating. Okay. Now look at a text like this, verse nine. Then they will deliver you up. Uh, to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Was that something that happened back then? Yes. No, it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. The the <coughs> Muslims and the Jews or uh, the ISIS, they hate us right now because we're Christians. Sure, sure. Okay, but it so it happened back then. Okay, so it actually has been happening all along. Right. All along. I mean, the, the whole human course of history. Getting, <clears throat> You've had certain people that have been inspired to try to take advantage of others and persecute others. 
so forth. So this has been something this has been going on for quite a while, right? See, Jesus generalized <clears throat> this thing and these were things that's been going on mm -hmm. and he knew it was going to go on. But what we're looking for mm -hmm. is specifics. We're looking for exacts. Okay. Not not something that's general. Yeah. And also, could it also be uh, at the end of time that it's not just certain things happening throughout history at certain times, but it's all of these things happening at one certain time together, right? Throughout the world. Right, throughout the world, okay. Okay, so as you come down here to verse uh, uh, 15, <coughs> he talks about um, a time of great tribulation. And if you read a book like Desire of Ages, uh, the author in that book suggests that Jesus is mingling here the destruction of the temple with the destruction of the world because he doesn't want to give, he doesn't want to actually give the disciples a full impact of what they're going to be facing because it would be too overwhelming. And so he's mingling both of these things because we're talking about dual application, aren't we? We're talking about the, the destruction of the temple was an application of the ultimate fulfillment, which would be the destruction of the world. Okay, so you can see how history is being repeated and how you have one application pointing to yeah, an ultimate. I, that, I've got a question already. This abomination of desolation, that, that statement uh, tears me up. I don't even understand it. Well, let's look at that for just a second, okay? We're, we're, we'll obviously get more into that um, as we go through our series. Makes sense from Daniel. Yeah. But Jesus, of course, is talking here. He says, therefore, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand. And then, of course, it goes through a whole list of when you see this happening. Now, <clears throat> here again is where um, you can apply the Hebrew concept. Because... <clears throat> What's going to happen here is uh, something s specific, and Jesus is saying, when you see it. So what, so what does that mean? It means it's, this is an event you're going to be able to observe. Right? And <clears throat> when, you, uh, <clears throat> when, you, when you look at what this is talking about, <clears throat> you begin to realize that, that uh, um, it's... <clears throat> It's something that's going to occur uh, first century. I mean, when he's talking here, it's about what, 32 AD, somewhere in that neighborhood, 32, 33 AD. And he's talking to a group of men, and they're going to see this event take place. So it's going to take place in their lifetime. But does it also have a greater application? Is there a time when it'll be repeated in history? Is there a time when it'll be <clears throat> a worldwide consideration? Okay. And the answer to that is something that we'll, we'll find out a little bit later. But um, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Now, a lot of people, if you look in the commentaries, and if you understand uh, uh, what some of the scholars say, they'll say that this event actually is talking about a fellow named Antiochus Epiphanes, who in the 3rd century B.C., uh, brought a pig into the sanctuary and slaughtered it on the altar. And that was the abomination. There's some commentaries that say that. Okay? You done what? <clears throat> now, why why couldn't that be the case? Why couldn't that that be what Jesus is referring to here? Number one, that's just a minor thing. <clears throat> it, it it doesn't mean that thing. I mean, it's just he was looking at he was looking down the telescope of time, and he seen what the real abomination was. And it was not some man who could not fulfill the prophecies that were stated. Because it said it was prophecy name. It was also <coughs> when Jesus said, when you see, meaning see, future, yeah, right. and Antiochus <coughs> Epiphanes happened several hundred years before. Wait. So while he was a type of somebody who would desecrate the temple, he didn't destroy the temple. No. He just... <coughs> he just did something abominable inside. Well, so did the Jews. I mean, the Jews were in there praying to the sun and offering sacrifices to pagan gods inside the temple. Some of the very priests... Sun worship. Were, I mean, yeah. they were doing all kinds of things. Okay. 
So the real key is that Jesus is clarifying to those men he's talking to when you see this happen. When they see. When they see it happen. Future. Right. So he was pointing it to the future, the specific event referred to in Daniel. But it was not very many years. Okay. Yeah, 40 some years later, right? They ended up, if you go to Luke chapter 21, if you just flip over there for, for just a minute, you'll see where this ended up taking place. We've got two visitors on our stream today. Vicky's online and so is Debbie. We're well, good. Nice. So when you go to Luke 21, um, these are some, this is another perspective uh, talking about the same event. In chapter uh, 21, verse 20, in Luke, it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Okay? So what Jesus is referring to here and what Luke clarifies is that the desolation that he's referring to is the armies surrounding Jerusalem. Okay? And when did that take place? 78. Okay, well actually we're going to Actually 66. Okay, we're back up three and a half years. Before the destruction of the temple, three and a half years earlier, uh, General Cestius went and surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Right. Okay? And this is the desolation that Jesus was referring to. They ended up leaving. They had every advantage and opportunity to attack the city, but for some reason they left. And when they left, the Jews inside the city went out and attacked them from the rear and really put a hurting on the Roman soldiers. So that when Titus came back three and a half years later, they had very little tolerance and very little mercy and compassion for trying to save even the temple and whatnot. Not only that, but after they left, <coughs> the true Christians, the true followers of Christ, left. Correct. Not one not one Christian was killed. Because what does it say in Matthew 24? When you see it, flee. That's right. Flee. Yeah. And that's what they did. You see the end of flee. Well, see? They, <coughs> they, they uh, burnt the temple to the ground, you know, uh, other than the, <coughs> the, the <coughs> brick, and they pried every one of them off <coughs> because all the gold that was in that temple melted and run down. That's the reason that no brick was left on nothing because they went in between the bricks and everything and they got, got all the gold out of it, <coughs> and that's the reason that and Jesus said there'd be not one stone, stone upon one another, another because it <clears throat> go run down and around the cracks of the of the stones and uh, after it burnt, that's what they done. They pried every stone off and that's something. to get it. Yeah, so it was literally fulfilled because the motivation to get the treasure, the the, uh, the remnants of gold that had that had melted. Yeah. Quite something, you know, how accurate the Bible is. All right, now the, another thing that we want to look at is and contrast that with. There a difference between those two? Sure. We're living in the time, <coughs> in the time of the end, but not at the end of time. Time yes. of the end means <coughs> coming up to. The end of time means it's finished. It's over. Okay. Um, there are several. You don't ever see this phrase in Scripture. If you if you um, got on into the concordance and you typed in end of time or the end of time, you won't find one reference in the Bible that, that mentions that. Okay. But are there some scriptures that indicate that it's talking about this very event? There, what scriptures are talking about the end of time? The end of time is when God closes the door. Well, Daniel right? talks about it, don't they? Daniel talks about it. Revelation. Okay. Revelation talks about it. And to be a little more specific, uh, for example, Matthew 
uh, 24. We were just there. Right? If you look at verse 14 in Matthew, I just want you to see that even though it doesn't use that phrase, those exact words, if you look at verse 14, it says, "In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay? That's talking about the end of time. Right? The end of time. Um, now, what's also interesting is that, uh, of course, Matthew is writing this, but <coughs> Paul's understanding, you go into the book of Romans, and I think there's two or three verses in Scripture, where Paul concludes that the gospel had gone, had already gone to the then known world. And his understanding is that the gospel had been preached to the, all the world. So, what, what is Paul going to be thinking in, in regards to this verse here that Matthew writes? What's Paul going to be thinking? Hey, the end, the end is any time. We're living in the last days. Because the gospel has gone to all the world. So Paul had an expectation that the Lord would come in his day. And you, you get that from when you read like Thessalonians 4, you know. The Lord will come from heaven with a shout, the trumpet will sound. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. He was including himself. See? So he had that expectation. So the gospel to all the world, then the end will come. Um, Daniel 12, 2 is another one uh, where that's talking about... Uh, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, actually, one and two. Yeah, one, verse one, at that time Michael shall stand up, Michael, the great prince, which stands for the sons of, of your people. There should be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. So, you can see the Bible doesn't use that exact phrase, but it talks about being delivered, it talks about uh, the end will come, etc. Uh, Revelation 8 is another indication, Revelation 22 is another one, where you find probationary time coming to an end. But it like says see? that people will run to and fro, and, and knowledge will be increased. We seek for us <coughs> the time of the end is our, is our road signs. It's showing us exactly what we're going to be going through, what it's going to be going through, and what's going to be happening. But whenever it gets to the end of time, that means time has ceased. There is no more of it. Okay, let's uh, assume for sake of conversation on this timeline that we're running um, 7,000 years. Okay? And probation, close of probation, is at the 6,000 year mark. Right. Okay. And of course, plus the millennium. Okay, so you can see, you can see you know, this, I know this group here, probably those that are watching, has <coughs> probably heard of the, the 7,000 year cycle of time. And so we're, we'll be able to prove that later. We're not going to be able to, I'm just going to say, let's just assume that for right now, that we have 6,000 years of time for the sake of an, of an example. All right. All right, so here's the beginning of that time period, probationary time. Here's the middle, and this is the end, right? Okay. okay. So we have those three. All right. The end of time. Where's the end of time? All the way down to the first. It's exit. right here, right? That's the end That's of time. Long, okay. There's now, no more time. There's no more probationary time. Right. How about the time of the end? <laughs> See, that could go all the way from back here to the beginning, all the way up to the six thousand. So you're saying the, end, the, end, the time of the end could be from here sure, all the way? Sure, because in Genesis, Genesis 3.15, he said, that was the first prophecy. And it says, hey, the, he's going to bruise your heel, and you're going to bruise his heel. That was, that was from the beginning, right there it was a prophecy. Right, well. A prophecy. So it could start right there, yes. This is pre-sin here. Right. Okay. Sin comes in, or time. Right. Time starts right there right. With, with sin. Okay, we understand that. Right. And God, but God has God is not caught off guard. He has this plan in place. Should he sin occur? Should sin occur? But it's going to run a course. Six thousand. It's years. going to run a course. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. it's gonna, God's not arbitrary. He's not going to let it go on forever and ever and ever. It's going to run a course. It's going to play out. And then it's going, it's going to end. Okay? But there's something in the Bible called the time of the end. That is our guide. That's our, our road signs. It tells us what to look for. Right. I don't think the time of the end could be the beginning. I don't think the time of the end could even be the middle. See, that's not logical. That's not common sense. And that's what we're trying to... I mean, you might be able to theologically... You're saying I'm dumb, Jerry. No, I'm saying you might be able to make a theological case okay. for it, but it's not practical. It's not common sense and it's not okay. logic. Okay. We're talking about the time of the end. Okay. Um, look... I mean, let's let's do it this way. Let's okay, break. okay. Wait a minute. Then, then when did the time of the end start? See, that's the question. That's the question that we want to answer today. Well, the when did, that I wrong, I won't know when when did the time of the end begin? Okay. When did it begin? 1844. It didn't begin here. That's the beginning. Kenny, I like that answer. Okay. That's where it started. 1844. I, 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 I like that answer. All right, well, let's break it down. Let's break it down a little bit more. Let's, let's, let's take this plan, this segment, this cycle, and let's break it down a little bit more. We can, we can break this down into, uh, into three, three categories. Okay? Who can tell me what those, those segments are? 2000. Okay, we can break these down into 2,000 year segments, all right? Okay, the first 2,000 years. The Adamic? Okay, he's saying the Adamic, which is from Adam, the first man, to Noah, okay? So the first 2,000 years of human history, we have what we call the Adamic, because... Uh, Adamic, Adamic from Adam, Adam, from Adam to Noah. Yeah, that's just, what it means. The, the Adam, in other words, um, those people that lived before the flood. You know, you had the flood somewhere in here. Okay, those people that lived before the flood. When you when you calculate all the begats, you know, you go through the begats, you come up with approximately 1,650 years to the time of the flood. Noah lives 350 years after. Okay, so you end up with a 2,000 year period of time from Adam to Noah. And that covers ten generations. So the first two thousand years of history covers ten generations, Adam to Noah. Okay. And again, when you start breaking down, biblically breaking down the time, then of course you can better define what the Bible is talking about here. Okay. All right. How about the next one here? Noah, Noah has been given the covenant promise. Noah to Abraham. Okay, Noah goes to Abram. Ab not many people realize that right here, Abram, who would later become Abraham, he is about 58, 60 years old when Noah passes. Okay, and of course when he set, when he's when Abram is set is 75, he ends up leaving Haran and going to where God's telling him to go. Okay, but. But you got Abram here. So you have Abram. Now Abram is the father of what group of people? Jews. Okay. So what we have here is the beginning of the Jewish dispensation. Dispensation of time. Alright? Now, when does that start and when does it end? Well it starts, right? It starts two thousand years after Adam. Okay. It starts when when uh, Abram is is uh, probably well, when, I guess when he's probably 75 is when he actually gets the mandate from God to go forth. Okay? But Noah has passed that covenant on. Some, some people even think, there's no way to biblically prove it, that they haven't even lived together for a while. But that's, that's just somebody's thinking. But at any rate, when does this end? This has a start. See, again, even in these dispensations, they have a start and they have an end. A start and an end. A start and an end. When does the Jewish dispensation end? I think 34 AD at Stone and Stephen. Okay. So the Jews have, re have rejected the Messiah. And now goes to the Gentiles. They've Messiah. crucified Christ 31 AD, okay, on the Passover. In right. 34 AD, they stoned Stephen. Another three and a half years, they're given a, a specific probationary time. And so this ends in 34 AD. 
Okay, so you have a start, you have an end. Dang, that good. Interestingly enough, this period also covers 2,000 years. Okay. This, this takes you back to 1967 BC, right in that na neighborhood, and that gives you a, a 2,000 year period as well when this was occurring after the flood. Now, once Stephen is stoned, what happens to the gospel message? It goes to the Gentiles. Okay, it goes to the Gentiles. Paul's already out there. And they the Christian dispensation. So you got Light the Christian. On, The Christian dispensation. All right. Now remember, if we're dealing with 6,000 years of probationary time, we've already exhausted 2, 4, and from 34 AD to here, what does it put us up to? 1844. Like 19, um, 1981 or 2. What is it? 1981? Okay. In other words, from, from 34 AD... Coming two, coming. Uh, no, sixty. Coming two thousand six. No, it's more than that. No. In other words. Oh, okay. If if this formula has any validity at all, and the Christian dispensation is also going to have two thousand, and we're not trying to verify that right now today, but just for the sake of illustration, what we're looking for is this: when is the time of the end? Okay. Um, we're breaking it down. It's not the Adamic dispensation. It's let's, not make, the let's, make, let's make it clear that we're not setting dates. Yeah, we're, we're not saying it's going to be <coughs> August the 1st, 2034. Correct. That's correct. We're just looking at a blueprint here. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so here you have... So it, could, we say, could we say that the time of the end is going to be during the Christian dispensation? Yes. I think we could say that. Well, that's, that's fact. common it's sense. Cool. That's logical. That this is the last two thousand year period of time, according to this illustration. Okay, so we could we could we could start to say it's going to be the Christian dispensation that that's going to occur. Okay, so that's two thousand years. <coughs> now let's take a look. Open your your Bibles to uh, the Book of Daniel for a minute. Let's I'll see. Before the nineteen eighty one Oh, um, I'll Thank explain that later. Thank you. I'll just erase it right now. Okay, open the book of Daniel, chapter 8. And again, we want to try to fine-tune this a little bit more. All right? In Daniel chapter 8, uh, I'm starting at verse 15, okay? And some people may not be familiar with, as familiar with these particular verses, so I'm just going to go ahead and read through. It's not very long. But... Uh, Daniel has had a vision, okay? And it says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. Suddenly there stood before me. See, that's what we're doing here. We're, we're seeking for meaning, for understanding as to when is the time of the end, okay? All right, so Daniel is seeking for, for uh, meaning. And then what happens? Suddenly there stood before him one having the appearance of a man. He heard the man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, that's a pretty direct statement, isn't it? That's a, that's a declaration. <coughs> Gabriel, give this man understanding. Give Daniel the meaning. Give Daniel the meaning. Okay. So, Gabriel comes near where he stands, and of course, Daniel is afraid, and he falls on his face, and he... And but the angel says, Gabriel says to him, what? Understand, son of man, the vision refers to... Isn't that what it says? The vision refers to the time of the end. Okay? Exactly what it says. That, uh, <clears throat> that time of the end shall be the vision. Okay, now, not only does he say that, right? Look, look at a couple more verses here. Uh, Daniel is now going to go into like a, a, a trance or a vision, into a deep sleep. But the angel touches him and, and, and he stands him up and he says, Look, it's verse 19, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. 
Now let's remember this. And this is the second time that, that, that Gabriel was sent to Daniel. The first time, what did he tell him? He said, shut up the book. Seal up the book. It, you're not to know it right now. Right. So Daniel prays. Seal up the book to win. To the time of the end. Time of the end. Okay. Yeah. So in other words. And he comes back and he tells me, say, look, we're going to let you know this much. I want you to hang on to that thought too because that's an important element right there. Okay. Seal up the, seal up the prophecies of this book until the time of the end. Okay. So see, isn't, isn't it important for us to understand then when this is yes. on, on in, in human history? Sure. It's important that we have an understanding of when that is. Okay? All right. Now look what Daniel says. He says, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. Which is the time of the okay. end. Now, the word indignation, right? That's a clue. That's the, I guess it's probably the Aramaic. It's pronounced uh, Zahem. Okay? And Zahem means, it means fierceness, anger, wrath of God. Okay? That's what the indignation is. So, so what, Dan, what, what is Gabriel telling Daniel? What's Gabriel telling Daniel here? At some point in time, God is going to be angry. <coughs> He says, I, he says, the vision refers to this, the time of the end. Okay? And he says, look, I'm making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. Okay? So, we're, so he says, I'm, this vision applies to the very end of the time of the end. Is that, is that, is that okay to read it that way? Sure. Is that logical? Well, yeah, that's what it says. That's exactly what it says, right? Now, when... It says no. No, the word indignation is is God's anger. God's anger, God's wrath. And when, when is that going to be? When is that going to be? Tell me when the Bible the tells very us. The end, the time of the end. Okay, and more specifically, by the fourth place probation. Before and after. So the trumpets and the plagues. See the tr the seven the play seven plagues after probation closes. That's the full measure of God's indignation. But before that happens, during the seven trumpets, that's pictured as a partial. Okay, and how does how does the Bible say it? What does the Bible use? It uses a fraction. What's the fraction it uses? One third. Yeah. Okay. One third of this. One third of that. One third. Of, if you go through and read uh, Revelation um, nine, eight and nine, where you have the seven trumpets. Talking about a third of an impact on the planet, on the people, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So why why is it why is it pictured as a third? Which is the beginning of his anger. It's the beginning of his anger, but what hasn't happened yet? The full measure. That hasn't Those happened yet. Probation. Right. So what is so before before probation closes? That means mercy is still available. It's still there. Okay. That means but after this, still last for forgiveness. No after this, except mercy has ceased. The Holy Spirit's gone. Mercy has ceased, so you have the full wrath of God. Okay. So when it talks about the time of the end, this this verse, this this chapter in Daniel eight here, from Gabriel. Now, where did Gabriel get his information? Was he making it up from God? He got it right from the throne. Okay. So here you have Gabriel right from the throne of God saying the time of Excuse me. The time of the end is right down here. Okay. So in this Christian dispensation here, we're talking about not not the beginning here, but we're talking about down here as the time of the end. All right. Now let's 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 verify that. Okay. Here's what Gabriel is, is saying to him: I'm making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. So that's trumpets. We know that God's indignation is poured out trumpets and plagues. Okay, that's that's the, on both sides. That's on both sides of the close of probation, and this is one third listed as one third. This is full. Okay, so 
it's, again, Scripture is starting to narrow down for us when this time of the end is. Look what, look what he says next. He says, uh, shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. How can there be an appointed time if he doesn't have a time schedule? We'll see. There you go. There you go. If, there, if there's an appointed time for the end, and this is the end, right? We just we said that is the end. That's an appointed time. God is working from a blueprint. You see that, right? God is working from a blueprint. Now, look what Daniel says here. He says, The ram which you saw, having two horns, they're the kings of Medo Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Now, when we go back in previous chapters in the book of Daniel, to chapter 2, for example, we see Daniel back there outlining the four world empires. What are the four world empires that he lists in Daniel chapter 2? Right? We've got... Babylon, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, right, and Rome. Right? So in Daniel chapter 2, he's outlining world empires. Okay? But by the time we get to chapter 7 and 8, now, when he outlines these world empires, where do they take us historically from a time perspective? Where do they take us from? Probably about, what, about back here, about halfway through, on through to the coming of Christ. Because the Babylonian Empire came up, what, like 6, 700 BC? 605 BC. 605 BC. So we're coming from 605 BC all the way through. So, like Larry's saying, the toes are divided. We're down at the very end of the image, etc. And Christ comes, and the rock hits the image, and God sets up his kingdom. So we're, we're coming like 605 BC forward. That's Daniel chapter 2. So that's a broad brush, isn't it? It's a lot of time. 2,600 years or so. All right. So when we get down, as we, as we follow history, right? as we follow history, we, we realize that uh, that takes us all the way to the very end of, it's, it's during Rome divided, that we end up with the, with the Lord coming. Well, we, and we also know, also in this line, that Babylon is no longer, because me the person destroyed it. Right. Me the person no longer, <coughs> Christ over it. Right. Christ no longer, because Rome goes. The only thing now is when Rome is divided, <coughs> right, right, into the ten toes. Now, that is the end of it. There's, there's nothing left. Right. Now, now, watch what happens here, because what we're trying to figure out is, is Daniel talking about the conflict here? No. Is that what Gabriel's talking about? That's just what he said here. The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Medo Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Right there it is. Okay. But when did this take place? This well, was Greece took over 538. Oops, sorry. Actually, this took place 2,300 years ago. So, Gabriel, who? who Gabriel. Who's talking here? Gabriel, from the throne of God, tells Daniel, right, that... The latter end of the indignation, right here, is what this vision is about. But then he says, it's Medo Persia and Greece. Does that make any sense? It's 2,300 years ago. <clears throat> Does it make any sense that Gabriel would be saying, look, this vision is talking about God's indignation here, and then jump back 2,300 years? Does that make any sense? That doesn't make any sense, right? No. Not okay, so me. so when we try when we try to understand what Gabriel is saying, what are our options? Our options are, right? Uh, Gabriel, you're talking about something that happened 2,300 years ago, and the time of the end 
began 2,300 years ago. Okay, that's one option. Right? What's the other option? <coughs> To not, to not say Gabriel's referring to these particular people 2,300 years ago, but he's, look, he's identifying that area. Uh, the, those, the, the, in other words, same location, but obviously 2,300 years down, in, in, down the future toward the very end. Could Rome, we also be talking about Rome mentality? Be, I'm sorry, the same ahead. mentality? Mentality? The same mentality? Sure. Of these people? Yeah, absolutely. Same philosophy, yeah. same mentality, same perspective. What? And what do you got? Roy, Rome comes along there next, and you got the Pope, which is uh, uh, the Vatican. Yeah, and that actually developed yeah. probably a thousand years after this. A thousand, thousand years, years after Greece? And well, the Roman, you had pagan Rome first. Pagan Rome, Rome and did it, did then becoming Papal Rome. Okay, so the, the Bishop of Rome was like 300 AD. So you're probably 600 years before you get to the Bishops of Rome taking over. And then a progression of the establishment of the Vatican and the Popes and all that kind of thing. I can't remember when the first, first Pope came along. But anyway. Okay, so what, what I'm trying to point out to you is that when, the way some people interpret this, the, the prophecies of Daniel, especially concerning the time of the end, is that it started way, 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 way back in history. Okay? But we just showed here that when it talks about the indignation of God, the, the wrath of God being poured out, it's here and here. It's on both sides of the close of probation is when the wrath of God is poured out. Okay? And that's what Gabriel is saying here. He says, look, I'm making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the time of the end. Down near the very close. Okay? That's what he, that's the intent of what's being being said here. Now, now watch. Chapter seven even of Daniel. There's something very interesting about this. In chapter seven, you have the four beasts coming up out of the sea. You see that in verse three there? In chapter seven of Daniel, four great beasts came up from the sea. <clears throat> Everybody there? Yeah. Daniel 7, verse 3. Daniel says uh, he has a dream during the first year of Belshazzar. The kingdom of Babylon is still there. And he has this, this dream of four beasts coming up out of the sea. Okay. Now, a lot of scholars believe that these four beasts coming up out of the sea are the same four world empires that he identified in chapter 2. Okay? A lot of people believe that. Okay? That's one of the things I was taught when I began to look at Bible prophecy. However, however, when I when I started looking more closely at the verses and the intent and the interpretation, things started to jump out at me that began to say red flag here, red flag there. Here, and here's one of those things. It's Daniel himself. If if the, if these beasts are the same world empires. Do you think Daniel's going to recognize that? you think he's going to understand and sure recognize it? He would recognize... Because he'd already been told once. Because he's already been through this one time before. Okay? And he's living, he's contemporary in Babylon. He's living in the Babylonian Empire himself. So he, he would have full... He's already, he's already gone through... God's already given him the insight of the four world kingdoms in chapter 2. But look what he says in, in chapter 7 here, verse 15. Because again, in church 15 here, he's striving for understanding. He's striving for the interpretation. What, what does he say? Look at verse 15. What, is, what does it say in verse 15? After going through this, this vision that he has, he was grieved in his spirit. He was grieved in his spirit within my body, and the visions of my head, what? Troubled me. Troubled me. Wow. In other words, he's, they didn't understand. He didn't understand. He's in, he's in distress here. He doesn't, he doesn't, he's in the, these, this particular vision 
doesn't seem to have any connection at all to the one in chapter 2, even though many scholars have tied them together and said this is just a repeat and an enlargement of what happened in chapter 2. But then uh, what did Daniel do? For seven days he prayed. <coughs> for wisdom and understanding, he didn't know. Now, now, here's another interesting thing, too. That's right. What, what, what option does he have but to appeal? That's the only place he could get his answer. And that's the only thing we can do, too. Okay. But now, remember, you said, and it's listed in chapter 11, well, chapter 12, uh, that this time period would be revealed when? This would be sealed. This information would be sealed until when? The end, time of the end. The time of the end. Okay. So an understanding. If, if people came along like like a fellow named Victorinus, third century, fourth century, a fellow named Victorinus came along, and he started to interpret the Book of Revelation. And he and he's the one that came up with the the idea of the uh, the, the, the statement and the enlargement principle. You know how how you have a repeat and enlarge. He's the one that came up with that. He was a Catholic monk in the fourth, fourth or fifth century, I think, and so he's he's living through what he considers to be the time of the seven churches and the time of the seven uh, trumpets and the seven seals. He thinks he thinks that all three of those are talking about the same period of time. That's Victorinus. Okay. Well, many scholars have pulled from that understanding. And so that's why in a lot of church denominations, they believe that the seven churches and the seven trumpets and the seven seals are all covering the same period of time. Okay? And we'll get, into, we'll get into some of that as we go further on and uh, have a, a, a more ultimate. In other words, remember, we're looking for the ultimate fulfillments of those things, not the applications. But would he have given the same interpretation <coughs> if he hadn't done it from, uh, from a Catholic point of view? I, I don't know. I don't know, because many people have come after him. But they're still taking it from him. And, and embraced it from, from his thinking. Okay? From his thinking. But now, notice something here. Daniel's grieved. He's troubled. He doesn't understand. And so he, he, he asks for help. And it says, um, he says, I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he doesn't understand this at all. And if it's the same, if it's if it's identifying the same world empires, uh, that would have seemed that would have been obvious to him, I believe. Okay. So this person tells him. So he told me to to and and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Okay, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings. But notice something. Where did they come from? Out of the sea. It doesn't say that. Read the verse. Uh, it says, Those great beasts which are four, four kings which arise out of the earth. Earth. Uh -oh. Well, that's because okay. of the population. <laughs> huh? That was because of the population at that time. Because no. water means multitudes and, and. Which would have came from, which was what I. I uh, say it came from the sea, but they actually Why? come from an unpopulated area. Right. Well, again, where does that take us? That takes us. Does that move us anywhere on the timeline? You know. In other yeah, words, they have to take us. Daniel sees the beast coming up out of the sea. The and the, that, the that, angel comes and says, "These are four kings coming up out of the earth." Right. Well, That's that, what they represent. He's well, the, the four, these four uh, kings, well, didn't that come from Alexander the Great's four generals? Well, if, if you're thinking about an application, perhaps. You see, if we go back and look at an application, then yeah, we could, we could probably say, yeah, this, this applies to, the, to that. But again, what is the ultimate fulfillment of these things? That's what we're looking for. We're looking. We're looking to establish the time of the end. Then, then coming up out of the land, does that specify a specific place, like the USA? See what we do. Remember, I talked in the beginning about when you interpret a, a verse of scripture, you have to look at what it says, 
and not what you want it to say. Remember me saying that? Okay. When you look at this verse here, uh, those great beasts which are four, four kings, what a lot of people will say is, oh, those are four kingdoms. <coughs> See, they'll call the kings four kingdoms. They'll say yeah. kings or kingdoms. Okay. Now the word king is the word Malik, in the, I think it's Aramaic, right? That's the word for king. It's used 179 times, and it always means king, and it's used one time as royalty, royal, or royalty. Okay? So, does the verse itself say they're kingdoms? It doesn't. But yet we've add, we add that. We say, oh, kings are kingdoms. And see, then we fall back right here. We go, oh, yeah, those are the four kingdoms right there. You see what happens when we don't look at the Scripture and stay with what it actually says? I mean, this is what we want it to say. Some people say this is what we want it to say. This, you know, chapter 7 is just a repeat of chapter 2. Well, I thought Babylon... I don't think so. I think Dan... Well, want to repeat chapter... I thought Babylon was a kingdom. Pardon me? Let me go with him. Babylon is a kingdom. Babylon, first world kingdom. Yeah. In Daniel chapter 2, these are the ones that, that uh, Daniel identified. Well, God, God gives him the interpretation. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of the image. And, and uh, <coughs> this he gives Daniel the interpretation. So we've got, we've got the four kingdoms already established in, in chapter 2. Why would we have to go through that again? Right. Well, he's talking about them before they developed. See, but, chapter 7 and 8. Right, Daniel 2. I think chapter 7 and 8 are tied together. Okay? What, and what, if they're tied together, we're talking about here. Let, let me get. Not Kenny. back here. Let me get Kenny right back. <clears throat> Kenny, what this was? This Daniel 2 was King Nebuchadnezzar's <clears throat> dream. It was oh, his image. dream. And then Daniel interpreted <laughs> these kingdoms. He was the one that said, this is going to, you're Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, but someone's coming up after you. And he gave a list of who was actually coming, going to take over. You know, this. But this was the king's dream <coughs> and Daniel's interpretation. Oh, okay. That was before that ever happened. Right, right. Yes, he, he's he, living he, in Babylon. Remember, they, they, they're being ca been taken captive in Babylon. Okay. So, ch chapter 7 and 8 are tied together. and <clears throat> However, most people have tied chapter 2 and 7 together. And I think chapter 7 and 8 are tied together, not 2 and 7. Okay. I think chapter 2 gives us the overview. And then chapter 7 and 8 start breaking it down. But, it's breaking it down at the last indignation, at the time of the end. Boy, it has to be. Okay. The way this world is right now and everything that's happened, let, you know, I know we're at the end. Okay, let, let me let me take this down one step further, okay? Because again, we, we know that we're, we're down at the time of the end. And we know that these prophecies were sealed up until the time of the end, right? So that means, <clears throat> that means people could make all kinds of ideas and throw out all kinds of suggestions. We could even look at applications. Right, uh, of, of things, but we're not dealing with the ultimate fulfillments until we get down here. In fact, you're not even going to be able to understand until we get down here. So isn't, isn't that what Daniel's saying? It's sealed up until the time of the end. Three, I put a note here in, 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 in the Bible. Here. Let me read this right thing. Okay, the, the first six chapters of Daniel, this history, the last six chapters of Daniel, is the <coughs> future. Verse 3 of chapter 7 says that stage 4 beasts come up out of the sea, a populated place. Verse 17 of chapter 7 says that four beasts come up out of the earth, a designated place. If the beasts of verse 3 and verse 7 are the same, then why was Daniel troubled and sick? In verse 15 and right. verse 27. And why did he need an interpretation of them? He was the one who had already interpreted to him too. Right. So see, so why these are these are things that we have to seriously look at, and not just accept someone else's 
tying Scripture together to make it say what they want it to say. Do you follow me? In other words, all we're doing is we're looking at what it says. We're looking at the Word, the context, we're looking at what it says, not what we want it to say. Okay? And what has happened in the past is people have tied 2 and 7 together. Right? But when we look at the time of the end, it seems to designate a period of time closer to the close of probationary time. Now, wouldn't that just make sense? That's just logical, okay? Now, when you, when you look at this cycle of time, you can actually break it down a little further. Okay? Um, when, when God came to Noah, and again, when you, when you, when you look at, if, you, if, you're, if you're talking about the close of probationary time, Look at other examples in Scripture. Where's the first close of probation that we find in Scripture? The flood. The flood. Okay. God comes to Noah and He says, The end of all flesh has come before me, and you have 120 years. Right? Now that was very literal. Wasn't that literal time for them? You have 120 years to, to build the boat, to get everything together, and hopefully, God is thinking, hopefully, the people that have strayed away will come back, will be drawn back to me, and I won't have to destroy this place. They'll be converted. Well, but that doesn't happen, does it? And on a smaller scale, son of the Gomorrah. Time of the end of the end. Okay, time the, that's a proposing a probation for that city. So what we see in Scripture, we see closes of probation examples for a world, a city, individuals, individuals okay, uh, temple, right? The sanctuary. So we see close of probations examples around. So when we look at the first one there, could God be giving us a clue? When He when He gives the 120, could He could, which is very literal for Noah and his family? Could could God be giving us a clue concerning the whole cycle? Yeah. Okay. We don't really see that or notice that until we get into the next dispensation. Okay. When we go to the Jewish dispensation, they develop another period of time which deals also with closing of probation at sorts, and that's called the Jubilee. Right? Yep. And how long was the Jubilee cycle? Fifty years. Okay, that was a fifty year cycle of time. And what happened what happened at the end of that fifty years? Everybody, uh was reimbursed for what they it's lost. Okay, so the 50th year, there, there was actually a, a series of seven seven-year periods of time, right? The seven-year cycle was called a, a Shemitah, Shemitah cycle, okay? And at the, every seventh year, the land would lay the, fallow, yeah. okay? The land would lay uh, un, unworked on that seventh year. It, it was, was for rest. Okay. It was God was building into the economy of the Jewish people. You see, here it was complete chaos and anarchy. God recognizes, you know, I need to really build something in into the methodology of, 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 of the economy of the people so that they take the time to get to know me, so that they trust me. I need to build a, a, a trust element into this. So every seventh year, no planting, no harvesting. You're going to trust in the Lord to provide. Okay? And that's going to happen every seven years. Seven of those cycles, after seven of those cycles, you have the year of Jubilee, which is an additional year where the land lays at rest. And this is where if you had, if your family had somehow lost your inheritance, lost your property, that came back to the original owner. Okay? So it was like a reboot, a restart. Mm -hmm. right? Every seven years, debts were canceled. It's called the year of release, actually. So every seven years, you've got the year of release. And then on the 50th year, you've got a restoration that takes place. Okay? So the Jubilee is really a symbol of... In fact, the Jubilee also begins right here, too. I mean, you... Uh, it's, it's a year, uh, it's a process where the land is going to be restored. Okay? And then, of course, here it goes back to the original owner, who was 
at, well, God, but Adam. Adam was the you know, original one. All right, so this deals with closing probationary time and a restoration. God gave them 120 of those, literally. But what if that was symbolic of the whole thing? What if you added 50? Of the, what if you added 100? What if you took 120 jubilee cycles? What does that give you? It gives you that 6,000 years. So this 120 that he gave to Noah is not just a number he pulled out of the hat. This was not only literal for them, but it was symbolic of the overall period of probation that the planet would have. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That's logical. It fits within the blueprint, right? It fits within the blueprint. So, what if, and this is just the thought that I'm throwing out here, what if the time of the end is this 49th, this last, this last jubilee cycle, if you will? What if it's the last 50? What if this time of the end is the last 50 years? <laughs> We get really close, don't we? <laughs> right? Well, close to me, Kenny, because mm -hmm. some of that fifth year is going to be cut short. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, like you said, you know, I mean, uh, here this is 2016. Coming up, yeah. Coming up. Uh, <coughs> boy, anything happened right there, I guess, since we're losing uh, that uh, cement year. That you, uh, Romans 13.11. Somebody look that up. Romans 13.11. Look that up in your Bible. Because, Kenny, what you're saying is very important. And Romans 13.11 is really what you're saying. Okay? You're really kind of <clears throat> commenting on, on, on that particular, particular verse of Scripture. Okay. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. Romans 13.11. Yeah. Not lagging in... Diligence, favoring, and spirit, serving the Lord. No, I got Acts 12, 13, 11. Okay. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, <clears throat> our salvation is nearer than we were, than we first believed. Okay. You see what Paul's saying there? And that knowing the time. <coughs> Do, do most Christians have any clue of where no. we are no. in time? No. But what no. does Scripture say? Scripture if says, they did, they'd be up here studying with us. They'd be up here studying. Thank you very much. Um, scripture says we are children of the light. We're not of darkness. Okay. But Scripture also says we wouldn't be able to understand this until it's unsealed down here. Okay. People in the first century even. People back but isn't it being unsealed for us right now? It so is. So that we can see it? It is. That's the point. That's the point. Greater insight and understanding is, is coming because Scripture tells us we should know the time. Yeah, it says, okay. I mean, we're not going to be caught in darkness for those, you know, that uh, are God's people. You know, we're supposed to understand <clears throat> where we're at and it's about time for... Jesus to come. Did he not give did he not give the Christians in Jerusalem the time and say, Look, when you see this, know to get out. Yes. Is he not saying the same thing yes. to us? He's like saying that? the same thing to us. That's exactly. Yes. Yes. He would not have said, Look, the time is near, here's what's going to happen if he didn't want us to know what it was. And see that was dealing with the close of probation for the city, right. Jerusalem. You see, so again, when you start linking all the, putting all the pieces together, you begin to realize our heavenly Father is merciful. He wants us to know. He wants us to understand when these things are going to happen. Even, even if this blueprint is completely accurate, that does not designate a day or an hour. No. Okay. There's nobody. There's nobody that's going to be able to say. Um, we know when God's going to close the door. There's 365 days right. in that year. Right. But, but like Larry's saying, we also know that even if this is the blueprint, we know that we may be in the time of the end. The end of the time. Okay. I mean, that says we... So we're in the time of the end. God is going to cut this short. 
It said we will not. James cut it short. He said no elect with him. Not he, elect he did. Himself. That's Matthew 24 and Romans also. So just, it said we should know. You you know, know the, even if they went up to that point, that's only 19 years from now. From now. Yeah. And he's going to cut time short. Short him, I don't know how long it may be. It may be a year. Okay. Two. Well, let's bring it back to one of the points we were talking about earlier, and that's a repeat of history. Okay. There seems to be good, a good indication from early pioneers in what's called the Millerite movement that God wanted to come prior to, to, to our generations. Okay? He wanted to come back in the 1800s. Right? So what that would mean is if God wanted to cut time short even back in the 1800s... He probably had 120 years back in 1800. That was his prerogative. Okay? He could have done it then. Right. Um, if you study church history, you realize there were all kinds of events taking place within church history where revivals and reformation were taking place around the world back in the 1800s. The stage there was, was being set for God to make His appearance. That means that everything that prophecy talks about would have had to have been met an ultimate fulfillment back then. You follow me? So if those events that took place back there were scheduled to be the ultimate fulfillments. And it didn't happen because of unbelief. And, it, and God's people went back into the wilderness. Right? What, had, what did those ultimate fulfillments now become? History. Applications. They, see? But what happens is, if you, if you don't understand that principle of, of history being repeated, and that we're coming around a second time, we're, we're just mirroring what happened to Israel. When did How, how did it happen with Israel? They, got up to the they came up to the border, the promised land. They sent out the spies. They came they back, back with a negative members. report of unbelief. So God wilderness. said what? God said, back right. into the wilderness. Right. We'll let those years. for 40 years. We'll let the, we are doing the same thing. Can you not see that we're doing the same thing? We're coming around a second time. All of those things that were scheduled to be ultimate fulfillments are now applications because the ultimate fulfillments are over here 150 plus years later. Different people. Different generations. Right? Yeah. And, and of course, maybe, maybe some of the... Uh, well, obviously the same locations. When we talk about Medo-Persia and Greece, you know, what's, you know what's left of the Grecian Empire? The little old country of Greece, right? The little old country of Greece. Now, it's interesting when you when you just last week in the news, there was there was information about Greece. Greece was uh, uh, Alexander the Great, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was news last week about little old Greece. <laughs> what was the news about Greece last week? Uh, I heard something on. And could Greece? Still be, still be. Now, different people, same area, different people, different generations, but could they still have a little part to play down here at the end of time? What, 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 what's about to happen to Greece? What did Greece report last week? Rose, what did Greece report last week? The risk of their economy toppling. They have, have filed that they will be unable oh, yeah. to, make to make their, their, pay their, bills. their uh, IMF payments, inter inter International Monetary Fund payments to the World Bank or whoever, they've, they've filed that they will not be able to meet those payments. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I hope you realize, that since we're all tied together now economically, it's only going to take one country faltering and fa falling bank and actually Technically filing for bankruptcy. And take the ones that started out with the euro. And it's going to have a snowball effect. A domino effect. Yeah. Okay? So hold on to your hats and hold on to your wallets because Greece has already notified the world we're going to falter. Yeah. We're going to falter. I okay. heard that in the news. Last week. We got, Last week. Out. Okay? Yeah. So again, when would these things be unsealed? When would prophecy be unsealed? During the time of the end. Okay. Now, if if God wanted to come in the 1800s, we may be looking at a different scenario 
same location, but maybe a diff different generations. But we're coming around a second time. If you don't get that, it's easy to confuse. It's easy to look back in history and say, pick out things in history and say, oh, that fits. Let me grab that and plug that in to my prophetic interpretation. Well, let me grab that and plug that into my... And it's easy to do that. But what Scripture is really pointing to are the ultimates at the time of the end. You see? And, and we're coming around to that place. And so I think we need to look... We need to look at Scripture, and especially prophecies, through the dual application glasses and coming around the second time, history repeating glasses. And we need to be looking at the ultimate fulfillments and not back in history at things that took place hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. Make sense? That's just logic. I'm just looking at logic. I'm looking at the, what the words actually mean, what they say. People, people are, are, are writing into what they wanted to say. In yeah, a lot they, of cases. They just keep in the same old scriptures all the time. Yeah. And they advance them. It's, it's, I understand. I understand completely. You know, I'm just saying that, that we who, who really want to dig below the surface here, we need to be analytical in one sense, but we also need to use a measure of common sense and logic. And, and when we put it on the board, you can see that logic. Okay? You can see that Gabriel says the time of the end is right here, not back here. Okay, and and people can try to put it back there, and they can grab legitimate applications, but they're not looking at the ultimate fulfillments. Now, what would be the advantage in, in what would be the advantage for Satan in doing that? Keeping people looking back in history <coughs> instead of forward, forward, forward. You see how detrimental that could be? You see how people could end up being totally surprised and off, their, off guard? Because they're looking back here, saying, oh, this fits here, this fits here, this fits here, not realizing that the ultimate fulfillment is still here. That makes sense? you got you looking way down the road. Yeah. Okay, years. so when we come to this, and first angel's message. Yep. Historically, when did this take place? 1840. Historically, okay, on, yeah, in, in yeah. the history books, this began, or this this took place in 1840, okay, with the Millerite movement. First angel's message sounding. The everlasting gospel to the whole world, okay. Um, back in 1840, but now the church went back into the wilderness. So what does that mean? What does that mean if the church went back into the wilderness? Yeah, then we're happy. It's going to happen again. This will happen again. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you that it's already it's, it's already happened. It's well underway. Okay. Right. But what we'll do next week, we'll pick it up in this verse next week. We'll go right here and we'll start looking systematically at what this verse actually says. Okay. And not what we wanted to say. Or not what we think it says, but what it actually says. Okay? But the important thing to understand is, and the reason we went through all this background is so that you would realize that this is re this is going to be this has been repeated because we're coming around a second time. Now the jury's brought this up. Now our last day events book that we each one have, Kenny, everybody. Yeah. What we do is on this thing here in the back, in the back, very back, back here. It's in scriptural, chronological order. And all you have to do, since we're going to be studying Revelation 14, right here it lists everything there is in chapter 14. You can go all through here, wherever it tells you to go, and read exactly what is pertaining to Revelation 14. So any, any scripture, it's a scriptural index, So, which is really great to have. It's a great tool. That's the same paperback you have. Yeah, it's the same thing you've got except mine's. Called uh, Last Day Events. Oh, yeah. Okay. But and it'll it, be in the back. And okay. again. So anyways, so next week we'll start with this, and uh, we'll look at what it says and what it doesn't say. Okay. All right. Um, Larry, would you like to close this with prayer? Sorry? Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask, please, that you open our blinded eyes, remove these scales from our eyes, that, Father, we will see truth accepted and apply it to our life. 
Father, please don't let us be deceived, but open to us your holy wills, your holy ways, that, Father, we'll be obedient to you. Father, help us to take and understand exactly what it is that you're trying to teach us and that we'll accept it completely and totally. Father, we love, trust, and believe in you, and we thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus Christ, your Son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.